1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. This is Space Vidcast 334 for Friday, October 22nd, 2010. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham, and there is no Carrie Ann Higginbotham tonight. All Everyone wish her well uh, so she can come back for next week's show. This is going to be an epic show of epic epicness. We have got a lot of really great things going on. First off, I want to welcome everyone watching a night of Space Vidcast at the Space Travelers Emporium hosted by San Diego Space, what an awesome way to get a community engaged in human spaceflight. What they're doing is they're getting a group of people all together around to watch Space Vidcast live, participate live, and have it all hosted at the Space Travelers Emporium. And soon I want to have them, if you guys are doing it, take some pictures, shoot it to me, and I'd love to show them in the show. And actually we're going to have some cool new features hopefully next week where we can take your user pictures and throw them up on these screens right back here, right in the middle of the show all via Posterous, which is going to be awesome. In addition, we've also got uh, what I'm calling 10K in 10 days. We're going to be heading down to STS-133. It's in Kennedy Space Center. It's the final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery. Well, with the final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery, we have to do it in like super ultra HD with every single bell and whistle ever, right? How can you not? So what we want to do is we want to upgrade our poor Mac Pro who stresses under the weight of not only having to do the live switching, but also the live HD encode and the live SD encode all at the same time. Actually, you can't quite do it. You'll notice sometimes during shows the frame rate drops. That's because the Mac Pro can't keep up. Well, what we want to do is buy a 12-core Mac Pro with a huge, insane, awesome GPU and a lot of memory, a lot of hard drives, and three more Blackmagic, uh, actually, there'd be Decklink cards for this particular Mac Pro. And uh, the cost for that is going to be $10,000. If you go to spacevidcast.com, you have the option to donate in the upper right hand corner and that's going to help us get the gear necessary to do a awesome job of STS-133. Now what happens if we don't raise 10k in 10 days? Fret not, we're still going to be the only place on the planet where you can get live HD streaming of space shuttle launches and we will continue to do it in high definition. It just won't be quite as cool as if we were able to do it with a Mac Pro that was able to keep up. Just not, it's just that little extra oomph that makes it really awesome. Now, if you do donate, uh, you get something in return. Donations start at $5, it's a one-time donation. You get a Space Vidcast sticker, which is awesome. The, all, the donations go from $5 all the way up to, well, $10,000, because that's how much we're looking for. And uh, at $10,000, you basically, I basically give you my firstborn. Uh, the, you just go to spacevidcast.com, click on the big link in the upper right-hand corner, it will tell you everything that you get. But I will say, we talked at one time about Space Vidcast Founders, that's where you get uh, all Space Vidcast product for life with a one-time fee that starts at $10,000 for th this promotion promotion for the 10K in 10 days, you can buy Founders for $1,000. So if you donate $1,000 to Space Vidcast, you will become a Space Vidcast founder. It gets you other cool things that other people don't actually have access to as well. And of course, steps in between. Hey, Calf, do you have the tea somewhere? How, how, here we go, hang on. In addition, anyone who spends some amount of money, I think it's $250, will get the first batches of T-0 the special blend of tea from Crow River Coffee Company, which is pretty cool. And you can see here, this is the final blend of tea that we're prepping. And uh, we'll, you know, we'll grab, we'll open this up and uh, uh, have some of it during post show. So stick around. On that note, why don't we get so started with a little bit? Oh, space news. <laughs> Oh, 
oh, hey, right straight into the graphic. That's awesome. Uh, this is the Hubble Space Telescope which has caught the collision of an asteroid. It's actually the aftermath of the collision. If you take a peek, it took, uh, with its Wild Field 3 camera, a bunch of pictures of the fi over a five month period. I think it's six different pictures. Uh, I'm sorry, it's four different pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope over a five month period. And you can kind of see them in the background. Back a while ago, we had that cool X shot. Well, this is the continuation of all those pictures, and you can see the animation where the pictures were taken uh, based on where uh, the Earth was and sub subsequently Hubble Space Tele Telescope. That was located in an asteroid belt, uh, kind of in between Mars and Jupiter. Now, the images were taken using visible light but color blue, and it, I, I actually personally think it would be a really cool, like, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, X Prize Foundation logo with that really cool like X looking shape. Uh, so those are the latest pictures coming off, or at least the latest really cool pictures because you know Hubble does tons and tons of pictures, uh, coming off the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's just neat to see the collision aftermath of two asteroids essentially impacting each other. Uh, and it's about 400 feet wide, which is 120 meters. And it contains enough, this is a fun stat, it contains enough dust to make a ball 65 feet or approximately 20 meters in diameter, and that's making up the tail of uh, that X looking type thing. Actually, calf roll that video one more time, just so you can see the very, very beginning. Because in, in this corner right over here, you can actually see they're gonna kind of zoom into the air. That's, I think, the best looking, the January 29th, 2010 picture. That's the coolest looking photo right there. You can kind of see the, the X a little bit better, and then you, you can see it just progressing again, February, and then so forth and so on. So that's a pretty nifty little I like that. That's kind of neat. I actually I like the animation in the background as well. All right. Um, Discovery, uh, once again talking about STS-133, has sprung a leak. Now, normally at this point, they would have to, for the type of leak, they would normally have to roll it back. But they've actually been working on this leak at the pad because if they roll back, I guarantee you they're missing their November 1st launch date. But uh, it's part of the Ohms pods. And we've actually got a picture of what the Ohms pods are. or It's actually one of the orbital maneuvering engines. So when you're looking at the uh, business end of the space shuttle, you can see in the middle there, those are the three space shuttle main engines. And on either side, you've got the, uh, the Ohms pod, uh, or the Ohm's engine, and you can, a uh, big red arrow pointing to it for you right there. That's the part, it's actually one of the lines feeding that. It's one of the, uh, and hopefully I get this pronounced correctly, monomethyl hydrazine uh, feed lines is starting to leak on that. Now they've actually replaced uh, or tightened down six bolts on the flange near the seals where the leak was and that actually stopped the leak. However, they're going to continue to do more work and they're going to actually replace two suspect seals in the fuel line uh, before Space Shuttle Discovery launches on November 1st. Uh, the idea being that NASA wants to be absolutely 100% sure that this vehicle is ready to go. So uh, there's no leak. Now, the hydrazine is kind of uh, fun stuff. That's toxic. You can't just, you know, deal with it. And actually, I believe they found out that there was a leak because there were, you know, they had workers kind of nearby and they had like a fishy smell coming from the aft part of the uh, orbiter. And they're like, hmm, that's not... That's not normal. I, I think we should probably check something there. And lo and behold, they found the they found the leak. So right now, uh, they don't anticipate any rollback. They don't anticipate any delays. And they have a few extra days of pad in there. And so they think that they'll be done in time. But uh, you know, if <laughs> if this continues to be an issue, this could delay the space shuttle flight because they're they're not going to launch unless they're absolutely sure. So this may not be a November first delay. However, all signs right now are looking at November first as a launch date for STS-133 on Space Shuttle Discovery. Speaking of launches, Arion Space has launched the Soyuz 21A with six Global Star satellites. Here's some launch footage.
So what they're doing is they're launching six new Global Star satellites. There's a picture of me on Flickr, I think it is, uh, at the Some North of Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge, the where we had a sat phone, uh, just in case we didn't have cell phone reception, and that was on a Global light, Star a network. And the sat phone didn't work very well because the Global Star network be. is degraded pretty severely and right now. The core stage now are burning. The boosters burn yeah, each 40. Can. That's 40 oh, tons. So the what we ended up what they ended up doing is they're launching new satellites to try to fix the degraded network to ensure that they can actually have worldwide coverage of phone service without these weird like blackout periods. And what's really funny is if you go to Global Star's website, you can actually see times when your phone will work. Well, it's not really ideal for a satellite phone or frankly any phone. Imagine picking up your phone and not having it work for, you know, six hours out of the day straight and you're having to wait for your cellular service to kick back in. So these satellites will help go up for their next generation uh, SATCOM services. And speaking of that, uh, interestingly enough, we did a story a while back on TerraStar who launched one of the most powerful satellite, uh, satellites, communication satellites, uh, not government, communi not government, so just communication satellites for consumers in the world. And they've got the really cool Windows Mobile smartphones where you don't have the giant antenna that pops up off the thing. Uh, they launched and they're now filing for Chapter 11. And they, they're just now releasing their first phone. So I'm not sure if there's more story behind that, if they're just trying to get their debt down or something like that. So you've got Global Star, who's had this degraded network for a while, putting up replacement satellites and building out their next generation satellite network. Oh, and speaking of, their next gen satellite network is going to have a 256 kilobits per second internet access. So anywhere you've got Global Star uh, satellite service, which is pretty much worldwide except for the poles, you'd have two 256 kilobits per second internet access, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but they're they're doing okay, and then TerraStar's over here going and going, ah! And they've got more satellites that they need to launch. They only blanket North America, and I really hope TerraStar makes it because their phones are epically awesome, uh, simply because you don't have the giant antenna and they're built it into a smartphone. Although Windows Mobile 6, really, guys, really. Um, in addition, speaking of really cool things, and I'm going to kind of go off on a tangent, I think, Bigelow Aerospace is looking really, really good. It, there's a great article on space.com talking about new space and specifically Bigelow Aerospace's ability to sign six new contracts in 2010. And NASA, there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, can we afford to do, let into private space go and do their own thing? Is there money in space? How is all this going to work? And uh, Bigelow is basically coming back with a resounding, yep, there's money in space, we've got the signed contracts. Uh, they've got, uh, they're also opening up an expansion in the North Las Vegas facility. It's a $20 million expansion in the range of like 185,000 square feet. And that's going to be for their next generation or uh, big, uh, what am I trying to say, space stations. That's the word I wanted. Uh, so for those who don't know, Bigelow Aerospace builds inflatable space stations. And one of the cool things is when they go up there, one of their inflatable space stations has pretty much the usable mass of the usable mass of the ISS. It's pretty freaking huge. And they can attach these things together and do some really neat things. So they've got, and they've got two uh, prototype units flying overhead right now. So it's not like they don't have hardware or they don't know what they're doing. They've already got the prototype units up in space. They're expanding their facility so that they can continue to uh, build their next generation uh, spacecraft and boom, pop it up there and off you go. Uh, the deals are really only MOUs or Memorandum of Understanding. That's really easy to say. And thank you, Hantner, for the link. A uh, usable volume. There you go. Uh, but that's really neat. And this is kind of where I wanted to get on my soapbox for a moment, if I may, and talk about uh, where we're at with space flight because a lot of, you know, the space shuttle is ending. Final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery, STS-133. It's kind of sad, but it's also kind of happy. And then we've got uh, Private Space. We've got SpaceX. We've got Bigelow Aerospace, x -Corps, Virgin Galactic. All these guys competing to bring you into space. And we've got a lot of people arguing over what the best technology is or why we need to do this or that. Or should we go to the moon first or Mars first? Should we hit asteroids? And um, I think that adds a lot of confusion in the marketplace. And I, I guess my point is, so long as we're putting humans into space, who cares? Who cares what vehicle we go up on? If Virgin Galactic gets there first in suborbital, think of the press that they're going to generate. Think of how much that's going to open up the public's eyes to human spaceflight, going, hey, maybe now I can actually do this. If Armadillo Aerospace makes it there for half the price first, which maybe they are, you know, right? I mean, they're both, they've announced that they've got a partnership with, with um, I'm thinking Spaceport America, and that's wrong. It's, uh, someone help me in the chat room. It's not Spaceport America. CAF. No, no. Space Adventures. There we go. 
Chat room hasn't helped me yet. They're still waiting to catch up. So, <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Glider Flyer. So they've got to deal with uh, space adventures. They're going to be pushing humans into space. Think about what that's going to do to the public consciousness of human spaceflight. A lot of people are going to say, well, what's the point? It's just suborbital flight. But that's just the first step in all of this stuff. 2010 is going to be, a, has been, a tipping point for human spaceflight and for space travel in general. And we're not going to really realize it, I think, for a little while yet. But 2011 is going to be a continuing testing year. So all the stuff that kind of tipped and fell over into real product, we're going to start seeing testing in 2011. And then 2012, that's going to be an amazing, epic year of awesomeness. I predict that will be the year you can go to space. And I think you'll be able to do it maybe through just one provider, possibly two providers. And we've also got companies working on putting stuff in lunar orbit putting stuff on the moon, building the promises of the 40s and 50s. You know, you go back to like yesterday's tomorrow and you look at what people thought it was going to be like in the year 2000, flying cars and colonies in space and colonies on the moon and stuff like that. Well, in reality, we're not actually that far away from it. Maybe we're 10 or, 10 or 20 years off from that vision, but we have an international space station. It was really fun. Watch the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Then go watch an EVA. And actually, if you can, watch them side by side and look at how similar they actually are. Both are kind of slow and <laughs> hard to get into, <laughs> but they both look very similar. And we are doing that stuff right now today. So those, those visions of the past are here now, but it's time for us to actually realize as a space community, rather than fighting about the tech, fighting about Constellation, fighting about all this other stuff, realizing that it's, it's just putting humanity in space that matters, getting us out there and excited about this stuff, taking baby steps. We don't have to go all the way to Mars right now. Let's get into suborbital flight. Let's go to the moon. Let's expand to Mars, but let's build this in a permanent and sustainable way. There's not just one way to do all this stuff. There are many different ways, and that's the beauty of competition. All right, that's, and as Vax said, the best answer is fly them all. Absolutely, fly them all. Let them all go into space, and then you pick which service provider you want to go on. You pick how long you want to be in space. You pick where you want to go into space. Imagine a Bigelow hotel, although Bigelow's kind of said that he really, they really don't want to do that type of thing. They don't want to get in the consumer market. They want to be you know, businesses and uh, you know, small countries who want to have a space station that's maybe not the ISS. But still, imagine what, what you'll be able to do if you have multiple carriers bringing you into space. And I believe that this was the year, 2010, because we're nearing the end of the year. This was the year where all of that starts to come together, as it were. All right, that's my, that's my soapbox. I didn't want to, yeah, <laughs> steals the soapbox. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, so that's, you know, without Carrie Ann, my, my bantering goes on far less than, say, a normal show. And that was kind of some of the space news. We've got um, uh, Discovery. We've got our live coverage coming up, and that's going to be a lot of fun. And I hope you guys enjoy what we do with Space Shuttle Discovery. We're having new bandwidth dropped. We're having um, a bunch of stuff changed so that we can provide you an even better experience in high definition for the launch, the final launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. And I hope you'll join us for that because it's going to be a whole lot of fun. And uh, it's not just about watching the space shuttle launch. It's about having a group of space geeks like ourselves, all in the chat room, all in the community, all participating, all chatting together, much like you see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, all these guys just having fun and uh, yelling at me for doing what I do, I guess. Uh, wh wh wait, wait, hang on. They're telling me to do the L-Cross news. What's the new L-Cross news? Because we did the L-Cross show. Oh, they, they found water, like they definitely found water. Is that the news? The, we've already found water, but now we're sure we found water news? That news? Because I thought that was kind of silly news. <laughs> Greater than 5%? Well, yeah. All right, here's the problem with L-Cross. Uh, as I understand it, the, and Vax, please correct me, because Vax was on the L-Cross team. Uh, the debate in the community is uh, whether uh, or not all the instrumentation is correct, because we're getting really conflicting reports as to how much water uh, should be on the moon based on what L-Cross sees and what uh, the Russians have seen and then what the Apollo program has seen. Uh, and some people are saying that those instruments may not have been uh, properly calibrated and all that other fun jazz. jazz. So um, I actually, I mean, I know the L-Cross guys, they seem, it, they, they've never mentioned any of that, so I don't know if, if any of that's true or not, but it seems like there needs to be another vehicle that should be sent up that does the same type of test just so we can verify the data. No, no, Vax, not after the press release today. 
So no, that, that, that information was not after today's press release. That was, at, that was the, when, remember when they came out with the buckets of water or the, the big huge jugs of water? That's where that piece of information came from. So uh, yeah, yeah. So there you go. Um, and everyone in the chat room is refreshing. So on that note, we'll, we'll, we'll leave you with that. Remember to check out Crow River Coffee so you can grab your T minus zero. This is going to be a short show. We're going to see you next week, and we're going to have a, we'll have a live interview. Carrie Ann will be back. It'll be our normal awesome show. You guys will have fun. We'll also kick in those space pods again so you can watch your space news uh, all throughout the week. And uh, we'll see you then. In 1969, Awesome. In addition, we've also got uh, what I'm calling 10K in 10 days. We're going to be heading down to STS-133. It's in Kennedy Space Center. It's the final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery. Well, with the final flight of Space Shuttle Discovery, we have to do it in like super ultra HD with every single bell and whistle ever, right? How can you not? So what we want to do is we want to upgrade our poor Mac Pro who stresses under the weight of not only having to do the live switching, but also the live HD encode and the live SD encode all at the same time. Actually, you can't quite do it. You'll notice sometimes during shows the frame rate drops. That's because the Mac Pro can't keep up. Well, what we want to do is buy a 12-core Mac Pro with a huge insane awesome GPU and a lot of memory, a lot of hard drive. In 1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next-generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. This is Space Vidcast 334 for Friday, October 22nd, 2010. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham, and there is no Carrie Ann Higginbotham tonight. All Everyone wish her well uh, so she can come back for next week's show. This is going to be an epic show of epic epicness. We have got a lot of really great things going on. First off, I want to welcome everyone watching a night of Space Vidcast at the Space Travelers Emporium hosted by San Diego Space, what an awesome way to get a community engaged in human spaceflight. What they're doing is they're getting a group of people all together around to watch Space Vidcast live, participate live, and have it all hosted at the Space Travelers Emporium. And soon I want to have them, if you guys are doing it, take some pictures, shoot it to me, and I'd love to show them in the show. And actually we're going to have some cool new features hopefully next week where we can take your user pictures and throw them up on these screens 
right back here, right in the middle of the show, all via Posterous, which is going to be drives and three more Black Magic. Uh, actually, there'd be Decklink cards for this particular Mac Pro, and uh, the cost for that is going to be ten thousand dollars. If you go to SpaceVidCast.com, you have the option to donate in the upper right-hand corner, and that's going to help us get the gear necessary to do a awesome job of STS-133. Now, what happens if we don't raise ten K in ten days? Fret not, we're still going to be the only place on the planet where you can get live HD streaming of space shuttle launches, and we will continue to do it in high definition. It just won't be quite as cool as if we were able to do it with a Mac Pro that was able to keep up. Just not, it's just that little extra oomph that makes it really awesome. Now, if you do donate, uh, you get something in return. Donations start at $5, it's a one-time donation. You get a space vacation.